वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू ऑल आई हैव विद मी फाइव डिफरेंट मेंबर्स इन फैक्ट वन ऑफ द मेंबर्स हैज एक्सप्रेस दिस इन एबिलिटी टू जॉइन सो वी हैव विद अस प्रेजेंटली मिस्टर भास्कर कोकन द मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर एनआरएल लिमिटेड इंडिया we have uh, with us mr harijit raha he is a secretary general indian tea association uh, mr pranjal changma is going to join us very soon he is on the way so when he joins i request him to join us on the dais we have with us with us mr rohit chasta he is a deputy general manager energy efficiency and sustainability strategy schneider electric from new delhi so i welcome uh, you all for this important session on energy and i just open up this session with a brief introduction or brief overview of uh, this very important sector uh, which plays a very prominent role for every individual for every nation in you know, it has aspirations to be really a developed nation so we all know that you know we cannot be without energy and we have been dependent a lot across the world on the fossil fuels and how this uh, fossil fuels have over the years you know been not just a source of energy but you know if you see the other side it has also been a big source of pollution and one of the major sources of pollution that we are going to discuss today is on the carbon based pollution and how we try to reduce this or the decarbonization effort that the entire world is presently focused on to open up once again on this session we all know that you know energy these days can be classified into two different categories one you know, where we really depend on this uh, fossil fuels or resources which are you know not renewable so we have with us the four panelists welcome mr pranjal you know, we have just started the session i welcome you to join us in the discussion so i was just talking about uh, the renewable and the non renewable energy forms so presently we rely a lot on the non renewable energy forms which uh, you all are aware probably on uh, the different forms of fossil fuels uh, that includes the coal it also includes uh, oil the natural gas and of course uh, you know if you see the western world it relies a lot on the nuclear energy yes so the do nuclear energy we don't really realize what are the side effects you know but the spent uh, fuel you know it has to be buried deep uh, several kilometers into the earth and we don't know when we will have a solution to ensure that you know they don't cause any harm to the the nature to the humans you know everything in the, in the world so as a though we don't see the immediate effect of nuclear waste definitely you know it's a very big challenge probably the challenge you know we will be able to solve over the coming decades or uh, in, the, in the coming century but we definitely are looking at alternatives to this uh, fossil fuels coal oil as well as uh, the natural gas and that is where you know, we have experts in this panel who will highlight the importance of you know this sector or how we can make a transition from the non renewable to uh, renewable energy forms i'll just again once again highlight the importance of the renewable energy forms so as such you know they are also classified into five different categories the renewable energy we all are aware of the abundant energy that we receive from the sun or the solar energy and throughout the world even across india you know, there is a major effort effort to transition you know to uh, you know develop very efficient solar cells we are also trying to modernize the existing solar cells we have presented the silicon based solar cells you know that the world is transitioning into organic again you know we have a carbon uh, problem there and there are there are new materials which are coming up in the form of solar energy it's called the perovskite based solar materials which are highly efficient and they combine with the, the silicon based uh, solar cells to make a tandem solar cell where the efficiencies have gone beyond 30% so that is one technology for the technology intervention in the solar sector similarly we have the second form of non renewable energy that's the wind again you know we are having very efficient turbines being installed in offshore on uh, you know remote uh, islands or even remote places to harness the wind energy the solar and wind again hybrid is itself is coming up in a very big way so this is another form of uh, energy the uh, renewable energy third we have the Uh, that the hydroelectricity okay again we have the hydro we have multiple options we have the flowing water we have the waves we have the current from the seas uh, the rivers we have uh, you know falling water or the waterfalls you know where and we have large dams but again you know people are moving away from that idea of constructing large dams because they again cause a lot of environmental damage 
environmental you know aspects are involved in that so you know but other forms of hydro energy are coming up in a very big way we can combine that with solar recently also from an, my institution there is a startup it's called con solar you know they have been able to develop the floating solar panels again they are trying to harness not just solar but also you have uh, technologies which you know uh, help in harnessing the uh, the flowing water and they combine that to produce some hybrid uh, form of energy okay so these are the three uh, very, very important one of the most important forms that we are likely to discuss or in this region that we are likely to harness the, the biomass the fourth form okay so the eastern himalayan region you know unlike the western himalayan region we get a lot of rainfall in this part of the world and you always see that the forests are evergreen similarly we have a lot of biodiversity so when we talk of harnessing the biomass we also have to see you know what is the best way to you know not do the deforestation yet you know utilize the huge biomass reserves that we have to efficiently convert that into you know a proper form of energy the fifth form you know in india we don't have that op option the geothermal energy but definitely you know that is an important aspect that is being considered across the world but definitely i will not bring it into discussion today because we may not have many options presently in this part of the region but definitely that's another the fifth form of the energy the last point i would like to cover before i open up to my panelists is on one of the topics that is discussed across the world is on the net zero emission when we talk about the decarbonization one term that you will uh, you know hear very frequently it's called net zero or sometimes it is also called as a you know, carbon neutral so that doesn't mean that you know we completely will be able to eliminate all carbon emissions you know already carbon dioxide one of the greenhouse gases is present in the environment so before human intervention before technology came in you know we have to ensure that you know we can bring it to close to that level of the carbon content that is present so to achieve that net zero content that is what is being discussed across the world in various uh, meetings in even in the cop 28 you know the, the the meeting that was held very recently in dubai you know so these are some of the very important aspects that are being discussed so we have lot of avenues lot of opportunities and there is a uh, big involvement required from the industry from psus you know from policy makers to ensure that every country you know every industry or you know every organization you know makes a conscious effort on ensuring that the carbon emission or the reduction in the carbon emission or utilization of carbon that is already available can be done you know methods to utilize them in a proper way are there so with these few words once again i welcome you all to this important session on energy or renewable energy or in decarbonization and how that is likely to influence our energy economy or you know our, our carbon based economy in the next few years so with these few words once again welcome to my panelists and uh, our very first speaker now is mr bhaskar poka uh, request you sir to you know, speak for 5 to 7 minutes so we'll have one round of uh, you know discussion one round of uh, hearing from all the panelists and then we are planning to open it up for any question and answer session at least you know, one one question all the panelists can take up and if time permits we'll again uh, have a closing round of uh, you know discussion or uh, share their views before we wind up the session so thank you very much once again i request mr pokan uh, to please share his views thank you thank you professor ayer and thank you malikara foundation for having me here so that i can exchange my views with the uh, gatherings the august gathering here and uh, with uh, due respect to my uh, fellow panelists i will just uh, start my introduction we are just pick up from uh, where uh, professor ayer has concluded he has outlined number of renewable resources from where energy can be harnessed i would like to start by saying that since india has a ambitious goal of becoming a developed country by 2047 now the debates are on whether a should 6% annual rate of growth is good enough or not or definitely people are of a conscious uh, i mean uh, a view that uh, even 6% is not good enough if a country has to grow unfortunately it will need some energy and india's average energy consumption is one third of the global average so i am not suggesting that we should start consuming like the way the west has uh, shown us uh, that is not the way to develop that we have come to know nonetheless we will be consuming much more energy that we do per capita when we actually move towards more and more development whether that will come from the uh, traditional sources the answer would be no 
but how soon we can uh, transition away from the fossil fuel is the question that we have to answer. But for some time, fossil fuel is there to remain. So therefore, the question of decarbonizing the uh, energy saving and thereby decarbonizing even the hydrocarbon energy sources. The, uh, for us, say for uh, a refinery like us, how do you decarbonize the refinery? That is the question that we are asking ourselves. Though we have already given a target by 2030, we will become carbon neutral. As Professor Ayer has said, carbon neutrality doesn't mean that we will not emit. We will emit, but we will compensate in a way that the net is zero actually. That's what we are planning to do. In a refinery, as you know, uh, in the last one and a half decade, we have tried to strip any sulfur from the fuel that we give to the market. In the quest to strip the sulfur, we wanted to have more and more hydrogenation process, hydro processing. For hydro processing, you need hydrogen. Now, how do you produce hydrogen? There is a process called steam methane reforming. Unfortunately, to produce 1 kg of hydrogen, actually you emit almost 10 kg of carbon dioxide that way. If you go for a steam carbon, uh, steam methane uh, uh, reforming process. So that is the process. So therefore, the first aim is to capture the carbon if there is any option. So there are means by which you can actually capture the carbon by using an MI, collect the carbon, put it underground, which is called as sequestration. That, of course, has to be supported by geology of that place. But another alternative is uh, utilization. That is why the term called CCUS. So utilization has many manifestations. The people can produce from the capture of carbon dioxide and if you have a green hydrogen, I will come to green hydrogen a little later, but if you have green hydrogen and if you have cap captured carbon dioxide, you can produce many molecules starting from methanol, then methanol to uh, that uh, SAM, uh, sustainable aviation. Even methanol can be converted to olefin. So you have the typical olefin and olefin molecules and that, that olefin can be further hydrogenated to make uh, SAM. SAM is currently being mandated in many countries and India is also thinking of putting a mandate on use of uh, sustainable aviation fuel for the aviation industry to the extent of 1% by year 2030. But today the problem is that, that SAM is three times more costlier than the conventional aviation turbine fuel. So somewhere the general public will also have to realize that all these green uh, technologies, green energy so sources will come at a cost. Let us not uh, get buoyed by the fall in solar prices that we have experienced. But solar is as, as good as the day last, actually. In the night and when actually there is no solar production, you need to go for storage. People have ventured out in many, many storage options like pump, micro, battery storage, and as uh, Professor Iyer was uh, putting it across, there will be a combination of hydro, uh, then uh, wind and solar. That combination may also give a continuous power. So these are the pathway people are obtaining. As far as hydrocarbon industries are concerned, we, as we talk about net zero, we are talking about carbon capture one. Second, we are trying to clean the hydrogen sources. We are actually putting electrolyzers to produce hydrogen. But when I say electrolyzer, again we are actually pushing another kind of problem. There is a need to have a very pure water. So we will compete with the public for water actually. And then uh, these uh, electrolyzers consume a lot of electricity. Another challenge will come, how do you make electricity available to such an extent to a single source? Suppose for example, when Rumaligar uh, refinery, you know that it is going to become 9 million tons. So we will uh, need around 138 kiloton of hydrogen per annum. To produce that kind of green hydrogen, we, we, will be need, we will be needing around 900 megawatt of electricity. The current peak demand of Assam is 2300 megawatt. So I am talking in terms of in a single place, we will be consuming 900 megawatt if we were to go total green on the hydrogen production side. So these are the challenges we have to navigate. None of the uh, so-called green is actually green. Suppose you talk about solar, 
solar panel where it will land up, we don't know. The production of solar panel is extremely energy sensitive now, when you make the vapors. Of course, uh, Professor Ayer has said that there are alternate ways which are coming out to produce solar cell. You look at the wind turbine, everything is plastic there actually. So, therefore, it is absolutely totally not green, end of life cycle, very planned. You talk of EVs, you are already uh, talking in terms of rare earth material where extraction itself consumes a lot of energy and the when the end of the life cycle where it lands. So these are the issues definitely we will navigate. The technologies will show us the way. I just wanted to give a flavor of what we are trying to do. With that I conclude my initial introduction. Thank you Mr. Pukan. I now request Mr. Arijit Raha, the Secretary General of the Indian Tea Association to share his perspective on what this industry is looking at in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ayer, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from a tea industry perspective, let me just try to structure my submissions on two counts, where we are on this issue, and where do we intend to go, and what needs to be done, as we see it from an industry perspective. I think most of you know that uh, tea is primarily an agro uh, operation and we have been very severely impacted by climate change. So much so that a FAO study published recently uh, has made tea vulnerable. We are saying that by 2050, if proper mitigation is not done, many of the tea areas in Assam may not exist. Uh, rainfall patterns have gone on. We are today a fully irrigated industry from a rain-fed crop. So that has been the transition for us. And therefore, it's extremely important for us, I think what has been done today, uh, it's extremely important for us that climate change interventions happen, decarbonization happens. Coming to our carbon footsteps, well, you see, T's, T estates are naturally, they serve as carbon sinks. Uh, we did a study for around Kaziranga about eight years ago to cater to a national green tribunal requirement, which evidenced that from each hectare of plantation, just taking into account the tea bushes, the forest trees, and the shade trees, the sequestration that happens is about 7.5 tons of CO2. This is without taking into account regional agri, without taking into account biomass and renewable options, which I'll just come to. In North India, the, North, the Himalayan region as we see it, we have about 5 lakh odd hectares under T. So on an as is various basis, we are carbon neutral because we sequester much more than we actually emit. Tea is manufactured with coal. Uh, large parts of Assam, of course, are on gas. Now, coming to the second point is, what are we doing now? We have now gone into decomposting, we have gone into regional agriculture, and also we are looking very closely at renewable energy sources. And about eight TA states in Kacha, in Assam today, are generating anything between 3 to 3.5 megawatts. We have got individual captive plants. Where these have been synchronized with the captive generators, we find that there has been a 30% reduction in the fossil fuel consumption. However, as I think Mr. Fukan was just mentioning, for tea manufactured, we do not as yet have a renewable energy source. Uh, Solar mitigates the use of coal, whether it's in a thermal, through thermal exchanges or otherwise, but it is still not enough to reach that 120 degrees C status that is required for manufacture of tea. You'll be happy to know that one of our member states, member companies, Goodrick in Darjeeling, has just achieved net zero status. Uh, the total carbon sequestration per kg of tea works out to almost 13 kgs for this group 5 tea estates. And as such, 
we are trying to now go into the next level of agroforestry. Recently, the government of Assam has liberalized the land use policy for the states, allowing us to convert 5% of our pro pro the DT grants for other economic uses. And one is looking at agroforestry very closely. Uh, there is, a, however, a need for us to be connected to a very active carbon market. Because unless that happens, uh, there is no payback. And it doesn't actually, uh, though, though it, it makes a lot of environmental sense, but then there is an investment too. The other thing that we have petitioned the government is to look at whether schemes like the CAMPA scheme, which looks at compensatory forest uh, mechanisms, could be extended to tier states so that, you know, reclaiming tier state land, looking at rejuvenation, replanting activity would qualify under, you know, uh, the scheme. So that I feel would accelerate very substantially our carbon footprints. From the power perspective, I think a lot has been said. Uh, you know, we, in certain pockets, we do still don't receive full electricity supply. And about eight to nine years ago, we, along with Deloitte, we were looking at open access for tea, whether we could do it on a cluster basis. Uh, I, I remember those days, Tripura ONGC had a, an arrangement. There was about 98 megawatts of uh, power available. But there again, uh, policy has come in between. So you need some amount of tweaking to be done in terms of reviewing the policy. Uh, there is a threshold of one megawatt that has to be the minimum for getting into a good captive generation setup. So I think if these steps are taken, uh, we would be able to perhaps, uh, you know, uh, improve our carbon footprints as we go along because tea is manufactured, the peak season is during the monsoon season when hydel is available. A. B, when you harvest tea leaf today in the morning, you are actually manufacturing it at night. So therefore, it is ideally suited for using a renewable energy source, if it can be sourced. Because in Assam, while 97% is solar, the other uh, energy forms, renewable energy forms are yet developing. So these are some of the initial comments as far as the tea sector is concerned. Um, I think we can talk about it later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ranijit, for uh, highlighting the importance of uh, what the tea industry requires. And of course, you know, we do not really uh, realize that uh, they also depend a lot or, you know, they are without access to the carbon-based economy. So we definitely have a few more points or, you know, we discuss more on that very soon. I now request our uh, next panelist. Mr. Pratil is here. I request you to please share your views about uh, what the Brahmaputra Cracker plan for your organization is looking forward to. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon to all of you, uh, Professor Ayar, other panelists, and I sting his guests present here. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Rajit Bhattakur Sahib and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you sharing my views. So we are in the very difficult situation today. I think all of you are it's agree with me because this art is not belong to us and we belong to the art and we have to clean the, our atmosphere. And today when I came from Dibrugar to Guwahati and towards the right side in the north side is a beautiful mountain whether we can destroy the mountain, it is in our hand. I don't think so. We are not capable, we are not doing anything for the, for the environment. We are selfish and we are here to discuss how to survive. And today need of the hour is that we have to survive ourselves and our also, other community also depend upon the us, we the human, mankind. Is is the responsible for all of us. And if you see what are the commitment we have, if you see the Himalaya region, and we are saying that we have to protect our Himalaya region, 
and what contribution of the Himalaya region. Only we are emitting 20 metric ton CO2, we are emitting from Himalaya region only. And that too equivalent to, if you compare, suppose if you are producing the power, 200 megawatt power plant emitting equivalent of amount of your CO2. So we have a lot of potential in this area, in the Himalaya region. I think all of you accepting me, as I have already mentioned, that what potential we have. So we can evaluate it to the Indian, so that 40% of the our non-conventional renewable energy we can produce from this area. So that potential we have. But if you have explored this potential, there will be many difficulties we have to face. I think all we have to agree on that, at what cost. And if you see world, what amount of this money is required to make 2050 is net zero. And for us, for India, same commitment 2070. Suppose if, you, if we achieve the 2070 at our net, net zero, so we need 13 trillion dollars. Where from we get this money? That's a big question for us. Similarly, in the world, world is required 300, your 300 trillion dollars. Where, where from we get this 300 dollars? So that is a big question for us. And another thing is that the initial con investment, whatever we are saying that solar, whatever we are saying the, that is the hydro, and everything is cost money for that. I think solution is our hand. Suppose instead of putting big unit, like the big industry, and today we are in competition, and we need money to survive, and all the industry, we are running behind on it, and we are putting our unit, such a big, and we are destroying the ecosystem, we are destroying the footprint, and we are destroying the diversity, and that is the rule of a government policy, and some initiative has to be provided on that. Because without that, it's not possible. I think if you see, and solar, whatever solar you need, if you see the instant Himalaya, so we can put a small solar unit. That is one option. Another option, we have a potential of hydropower. So we can set up a small hydropower unit in every area, even in the top also. So that can be possible. The only thing that we should not disturb the ecosystem. And regarding that, the broader takers, we are making the bad thing, we are making the polymers only. So, in the northeast, in the, in the northeast region, if you see the per capita polymer consumption is 3 kg only, in, in, in compare region to the Indian, it is around the 14 to 15 uh, kg, and worldwide it is more than 30 kg. So, I am saying that, why we are behind, behind that? Because in terms of the reuse or recycle, if you see the western country, they are far more advanced in that sector. Even they are consuming more than 30 kg, but they are making their business by recycling or reducing or reusing the material. So it's a great challenge for us and we have to I mean the educate our society for that and we are also responsible for that as a responsible citizen or as a responsible uh, businessman and we have to do certain action at our end. Already we are doing certain action and we are for the carbon capturing CO2. We are discussing with uh, Oil India, also it is an advanced stage. So we are going for this uh, CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. I think that one area we are exploring. And I am not uh, taking too much time. And with this, once again, thank you for inviting me in this program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pranjal. It was very nice to once again remind all of us that now we belong to the earth and definitely it doesn't belong to us with that opening remarks. And you also highlighted that uh, though you know, we are discussing a lot on the carbon uh, neutrality or reduction of the carbon footprint and the amount of polymers you know, which is mainly made up of these carbon based materials, or you know, carbon is the main backbone in all this thing, you know, the percentage of polymers that we utilize in this region is in only 3%. It is very good. Let us see you know, how we can also motivate other parts of the nation and the world to again reduce the consumption of plastics or these polymers in the day-to-day -day activities or day-to-day -day 
you know, every event or everything that we do. Thank you once again, Mr. Pratil. We'll come back to you uh, later and see, you know, what, how uh, Brahmaputra tractor can also contribute to the overall energy sector production of the carbon footprint. Our uh, next speaker is Mr. Rohit Zasta. I'll not uh, again uh, this thing. Uh, you know, please go ahead with your uh, discussion, sharing your views on Schneider Electric. You know, this is slightly different from other organizations. You know, they are a German company, but uh, definitely they are venturing into India in a very big way. And uh, let us see, you know, what their views are and how they can contribute, you know, in this part of the world, this part of the, of the nation for uh, the decarbonization efforts. Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ayer. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a small correction. We are French company, not German. So, uh, anyway, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Malipura Foundation, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this wonderful discussion. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, my esteemed panelists gave uh, very good views on what renewable energies uh, are capable of. Professor Ayer mentioned about the five forms of decarbonized energy sources. Uh, I would actually want to add a sixth one uh, to this whole piece. You know, uh, in the in the first round of conversation, uh, Sir mentioned about even solar energy or even wind energy are they actually decarbonized form of energy? Because you're you consuming some carbon when it is you know getting uh, into the whole <coughs> into the whole manufacturing process. So, uh, just coincidentally, a few days back, I was having a conversation with someone, and uh, uh, the person asked me that. What do you think is the greenest or the cleanest form of energy? Uh, which source would you term as the greenest or cleanest source? And my answer to that question was that the energy which is not getting generated at all. There cannot be anything cleaner and greener than energy not getting generated. So, you know, time and again we are focusing always or majorly on the whole supply side piece uh, of this whole energy landscape. Uh, which is to an extent is right as well. Uh, it's definitely a very important portion of the whole piece. What I also want to emphasize on that we should equally focus on the demand side of energy landscape as well. Uh, so it's as simple as this, as I mentioned about that, can there be anything cleaner, cheaper and more abundant than energy and resource efficiency in the solar aspect? So this is a slightly different perspective because we already, you know, uh, saw the whole conversation about renewables. So I'm not going to add to that, but just giving a slightly different perspective of can there be a, a more cleaner resource than energy not getting generated? Uh, in some <coughs> terminologies, we also call it the megawatt uh, of, of the whole aspect of power. So as I was mentioning, for a long time, supply side decarbonization has been the key or the focus area when it comes to the whole uh, aspect of decarbonization. As a, ma as a matter of fact, uh, if you talk about India's like you know decarbonization ambitions by 2030, uh, 50 percent, uh, almost 50 percent of the decarbonization opportunities are going to come from the demand side of the energy landscape as well. And when I say demand side, we're talking about things like energy efficiency, resource efficiency, circularity, something that we were mentioning or we were talking or discussing in the earlier sessions about how waste management uh, is another aspect. So overall circularity piece and even optimizing the processes, decarbonizing the processes through various ways. One of the first thing that comes to my mind in order to decarbonize the process is you electrify it. You know, you electrify it and then you make sure that the electricity is coming from a renewable or a decarbonized source of energy. Or even in cases like, uh, as Sir was mentioning, certain hard to abate sectors like refineries or let's say cement and steel, then we have to talk about some different alternative fuels or you know, fuel switching like green hydrogen, carbon capture, utilization, storage related technologies uh, as well. But if you see, uh, when it comes to the whole aspect of, you know, even just giving an analogy of one energy efficiency, you know, saving one unit of energy at our end use results in saving three to four uh, amount of energy on the power generation side. That's how the equation works, especially with, you know, a country like us where we're talking about major uh, uh, source of energy coming from the coal powered or thermal power plant uh, as well. So, if you ask me in terms of, you know, Sir Professor Rai was mentioning that how uh, Schneider Electric is helping uh, in this whole decarbonization piece, uh, we are working with, uh, you know, almost more than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies across the world. And 
a sim i won't say a simple it's very you know complex if we go into the detail but from a overview level if i tell you about three steps of how we are decarbonizing this whole energy landscape the first thing is make sure that the demand is as much optimized as possible where you come in, on, uh, on the whole aspect of resource and energy efficiency and circularity the step 2 is you make sure that the processes are optimized and electrified uh, which is again on the lines of it can be a alternative fuel or it can be the electrification of processes and the third step is that makes you make sure that electrified uh, process is powered by a renewable source of energy or a decarbonized source of energy that in and this is not something which comes as like a one step thing these all three things are to be done together in uh, collaboration with each other and this is how the pathway to a net zero and a decarbonized world or a region or a country or a company any example we can take this is how we can chart out the pathway uh, towards that particular piece uh, so this is like a first sort of uh, reaction or sort of an observation that i would give to this whole aspect of uh, energy landscape decarbonization and this particular sort of methodology that i'm mentioning it can transcend into across all sectors it can be a tea sector it can be a cement sector it can be a, a, you know a, a general industry or engineering industry the approach can transcend into uh, across sectors and across economies so that's where i would uh, kind of in my first remarks or observation and uh, happy to discuss more about in detail in subsequent rounds thank you thank you thank you so much mr roy i see a lot of uh, hands being raised but uh, organizers have request us to close this session but before the closing you know once again i would like to specially express my thanks to uh, valipara foundation uh, mr ranjit uh, you know he has put forward uh, you know this very important uh, panel and uh, you know because very necessary very necessary that you know the awareness comes and uh, all the panelists for a very enlightening uh, words and sharing your views we wanted one more round of opinion but you know definitely there is uh, you know we are we are short of time any member wants to come and discuss with any of the panelists so you are welcome we'll have a short break uh, for the lunch and uh, definitely you know we'll continue the discussion while we are having lunch and you know we'll have more opportunities to share our views you know get your opinion and see you know how we can collectively work for a uh, you know, decarbonized world and how we can contribute in you know whatever way whatever capacity is possible by us so once again thank you all for your enlightening words thank you for sharing your views and spending time thank you so much